Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I am so excited to talk to Dr. Eric Foreman today about PGTA. Hi, Eric. Hi, how are you, Amy? Thanks for having doing, me. Of course, thank you. And I want to tell our listeners about you because for those of you who don't know Dr. Foreman, he is one of the most respected and um, fertility doctors in our country. And not only that, the research he does kind of sets the standard for all of us. So it's just such an honor and privilege to have you on today. So you're the medical and lab director at Columbia University Fertility Center, and you oversee the medical practice as well as the IVF embryology and andrology labs. You, you actively also see patients in your practice with infertility and those seeking to preserve their fertility as well. And I already talked about all the research you've done and you've published more than 40 articles and I'm sure it's well over 40 in peer reviewed journals on a wide range of topics. And one for, for patients who are out there who know about elective single embryo transfers or ESETs, you're the one who basically set that as a standard in most clinics, not just in this country, but in the world. And you also revolutionized how we freeze eggs and your research proved that the rapid vitrification technology, which is the standard now, does not increase the risk of genetic abnormalities and resulting embryos. And here we are today to discuss a hot topic in fertility medicine, which is PGTA. Welcome again, Eric. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, thanks again for having me and for that really nice introduction. As you know, that there's a team, um, a team of doctors, nurses, researchers, patients, but I couldn't have done all of that without all the great people I wor I've worked with over the years. Um, but I am, I am excited to talk to you specifically about PGTA. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there was a recent Chinese study published in the New England Journal of Medicine about PGTA and it was titled live birth with or without pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. And first off for our listeners who don't necessarily know what PGTA is like, can you give me like a one minute definition? Like whatever you say to your patients go. Yeah. So, I mean, PGTA is, is a test that's performed on embryos um, in the IVF lab. Basically we know that, um, that to make a healthy baby, an embryo has to have the correct number of chromosomes. That's one of the key building blocks. Not the only thing, but it is important. And we know that um, that sometimes when egg and sperm combine, they contribute an incorrect number of chromosomes. That can result in embryos that don't implant or that um, can result in miscarriages or even ongoing trisomy type syndrome. So what PGTA is, is gives us the ability to take a few cells from an embryo and to be able to um, analyze the DNA from those cells, make a very accurate, although not perfect, nothing's perfect, but a very accurate prediction of the chromosome status of those cells, which correlates with the chromosome status of the embryo. And the goal is to selectively transfer an embryo with the correct number of chromosomes it has a better chance, although not a hundred percent chance, but a better chance of being able to result in a healthy ongoing pregnancy and live birth. And also to eliminate the ones that we think result in a lot of the failed transfers, not all of them, but a lot of them and the miscarriages and, and sometimes even termination. So in a nutshell, basically it's a selection tool to help us identify if there are chromosomally normal embryos and try to transfer those one at a time. And that's really what my prior research you know, focused on, that when we know the embryo is normal, they do really well one at a time. That also has dramatically lowered the multiple pregnancy rates and a lot of the complications that went along with that. I love that. It's a selection tool mm -hmm. and it's not perfect, but it is helpful and I agree with you. And why is this study getting a lot of attention right now? Well, one, I mean, the New England Journal of Medicine is, you know, a very prestigious journal. So I'm actually very happy to see, you know, PGTA in, you know, maybe the most prestigious journal. So every, you know, trial in the New England Journal of Medicine gets circulated, I think, in the media. So that's, that's one thing. But this was a large multi-center trial. I think, you know, although I have 
concerns about some of the design and the conclusions that we'll get to, I think it was well done. Um, I think the PGTA analysis, you know, seems to be done very well. The aneuploidy rates in this population, you know, are consistent with we, what we see in, in our clinic and the labs that we work with. And they got very good, you know, good results with the normal embryos that were transferred. So I think it was a well-designed trial. It's getting a lot of attention because for whatever reason, I think there are a lot of naysayers out there and detractors or skeptics. And I mean, I tend to be skeptical and, and wait till there's good evidence before adopting things. But there's definitely a community that is anti-PGTA and anti-quote-unquote add-ons. And so the final conclusion of this trial was that that PGTA did not improve the cumulative live birth rate from an IVF cycle. So those who I think want to detract from PGTA, PGTA say this, this doesn't help, it's expensive, and it's a way that maybe patients are being taken advantage of. But if we dig a little deeper into the details, which we will, I come out with a different conclusion from the same data. And you had concerns about the study of design, and I imagine that has something to do with your different conclusions. Talk to us about the study design and what your concerns are. Yeah, so, I mean, my main concern is that, one, this, this was a young population. I mean, PGTA, I offer it to every patient doing IVF because you can have a trisomy miscarriage even in your 20s, but I don't, I don't strongly recommend it in that age group. I do more strongly offer, even recommend in the later 30s, early 40s age group, where we know there becomes even a greater than 50% chance of aneuploidy in even good quality blastocysts. And I really want to transfer one embryo at a time, but it, it gets really difficult in that age group. So in this study, it was limited to women age 20 to 37. So the ones who have the highest rates of aneuploidy and maybe, I mean, studies need to still prove this, maybe have the most benefit from PGTA were not included. And also, you know, these patients um, were good responders. They, they produced 20 eggs and on average seven good quality blastocysts, which is great. But when we practice PGTA, usually we biopsy all of the good quality embryos because we want to be able to select from all of them. If it was always the case that, that the best you know, looking embryo normal, we wouldn't really need to do PGTA. We could always just transfer the best looking embryo. Sometimes it's the fourth or fifth best looking embryo that may be normal or maybe, again, some combination therein. So, you know, there are sometimes patients who produce a very high number of blastocysts and choose to only test a portion of them. But even then, it's usually six or eight. In this study, they limited the PGTA group to biopsying only their best quality three embryos. And the study design differing from other trials where it looked at one transfer you know, of an untested embryo or two, and one transfer of a tested embryo. Here, which I think is a good design, I think we should go beyond one transfer because we do really want to know what are the cumulative outcomes. But I just don't think it was reflective of how we practice or really gives you the full story because the control group that didn't do PGPA, they had an opportunity to transfer three times. And it's not so clear if they required single embryo transfer. I think on average, there were 1.3 embryos transferred. So sometimes they must have transferred two. But in the PGTA group, they could only choose from those three embryos biopsied. Um, and so many of those patients didn't have an opportunity to even have three transfers, but we, we don't have all this data, but I think it's reasonable to assume some of those patients had four or five, six embryos, but maybe only one out of three was normal and it didn't implant. And then that was it. They didn't have another chance, but they might have if their fourth or fifth or sixth embryo was normal. So, so that's my concern that I think it was a, you know, um, a good outcome to look at, but I think a better design would have been the way we practice biopsy all the embryos, even if it's four, five, six, seven. And if they have up to three normal embryos or mosaic, because now we do have a lot of data that, that mosaic embryos perform well and 
result in healthy babies, and those also were excluded. So if the PGTA patients had abnormal or mosaic embryos, those were not transferred. Um, but again, if they had been able to biopsy all of their embryos, they might more of them might have been able to have two or three transfers. In that scenario, it's not it's possible that even the cumulative live birth rate, I still don't think it's ever possible for the cumulative live birth rate to be higher. Again, if we're looking at all the embryos and eventually you transfer all of them, PGTA does not make the embryo better. We just, we hope it doesn't harm the embryo by biopsying it. And I think this study even goes a long way towards supporting the safety of it. We talk about that in a bit. Um, but it's not going to make more babies out of the same group of embryos. It just hopefully gets us there in fewer transfers and fewer miscarriages. But again, if we just looked at the first three transfers, I mean, it's even possible that there might have been more live births um, if that PGTA group had an opportunity to work with all of their embryos. Right. So what you're basically saying is what we do in the real world isn't how this study was designed. Because can you just share with our listeners, what do we do in the real world compared to how this, just one more time for us, for, yeah. for people who are listening. Again, I mean, typically in the real world, all the good quality blastocysts are biopsied and tested. And then we select amongst all of them. And especially for couples who want more than one child or maybe in their later 30s, I mean, that's a big advantage that's often overlooked from PGTA because it's nice and helpful to know if some of those other frozen embryos, even if the first transfer works, how many of the other ones are normal and would it be beneficial to consider another retrieval, quote unquote, banking, you know, if maybe none of them or only one of them are normal. So we do usually test like the whole cohort and then select amongst them. But here, the PGTA group, you know, had sort of a, a limitation that they only tested three of them. And then they were looking at up to three transfers, but many of those patients weren't able to transfer three normal embryos, but they may have had other embryos frozen. Um, so if you, if you look at some of the supplementary outcomes, there even was, you know, it wasn't statistically significant, but there actually was a numerically higher live birth rate. If you looked at all the, you know, all the outcomes, and we don't know all the details, but maybe they transferred some of those untested embryos, some of them got pregnant on their own. But basically, within a year, having done PGTA, there was actually more babies born. I mean, again, not statistically significant, but I think, again, it, it points to the safety of this approach that it's not, quote unquote, throwing away, um, you know, lots of potential live births, which is an argument that's been debated for years amongst those who, you know, who are skeptical of PGTA. They think that the biopsy is harming a lot of embryos, that that the te that technology is overcalling them abnormal, so we're losing a lot of live births. And those are definitely valid concerns. And I think it it is a risk and it could be done incorrectly, but when done well, which it appears like in this trial, that's one of the take-home messages for me, that it actually, there wasn't fewer, even with these limitations, um, the PGTA group did really well. I, and I love that you brought that up because in this patient population being under the age of 30, you would imagine that they would probably go back in two years to try and conceive again on average with another embryo that's frozen. And so I, you know, you and I, we project, we make projections for patients every single day about what their fertility will be like in two years. So we're not just thinking about a patient's first baby. We're thinking about their family size goals when we're trying to use a selection tool in their particular case. Do you agree? Yeah, exactly. And again, I think, you know, this, if this field is, you know, moving forward and then the research is getting better. So it's not just, you know, you have to look at pregnancy rate, but it's not, you know, not just getting pregnant you want to have a baby. So now we, we look at, you know, live birth rate, but even that maybe again, if you have other embryos frozen, it's cumulative live birth rate, but even beyond that, you know, it's desired family size. I mean, the research hasn't gone there yet, but, but yeah, I think it is, you know, one of the overlooked benefits of PGTA is for those who want two or three children, it helps them plan, are they going to be likely to achieve that from one egg retrieval when they're as young as they'll ever be? 
you know, or should they try to get more embryos while they're still in that age group, depending on the potential of the embryos that they have frozen? Right. So, and that does bring up another point that there, there are a lot of additional benefits that although live birth is important, it's not, in my view, the only thing. And I think our goal as reproductive endocrinologists, fertility specialists, and the ultimate goal of IVF, I mean, I think is to help couples achieve their desired family size, one healthy baby at a time, while minimizing like the burdens that go along with it, which include cost, include disappointment, miscarriage. So you see a lot of comments in the media that look, see, this shows that PGTA isn't necessary. But if you start talking to patients, which I have, and you do every single day, and if you said, okay, you could do three transfers and you'll have, you won't get pregnant, you'll have a miscarriage, but then you'll have a baby or do a transfer, get pregnant, have a baby, what are they going to choose? Again, not everyone falls in that category, but, but in these kind of studies or that kind of analysis, like they did just as well, they each had a live birth. Yes, but if we could avoid some of those setbacks, some of those patients, if you know, you know, get disappointed and don't come back right away, maybe never come back, they lose hope that it will ever work or where they insist, oh, one didn't work. Now I want to transfer two the next time. And, and then, you know, we know that again, twins can be great and, and healthy, but they do have higher risks of virtually every complication. So, so that's another area where this doesn't always reflect the real world. And I, I was involved in randomized trials. And I know in that setting, you know, there's research nurses and coordinators and patients agree to follow the protocol. But but in the real world, it's very difficult to say, okay, we'll just transfer one embryo at a time and eventually one will take. That may be true, but people drop out, they get discouraged, they insist on transferring multiple embryos. So PGTA really has, I think, made single embryo transfer, at least for the first couple or few tries, the standard, and, and everyone has been able to buy into that. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for this incredible summary. Um, you know, I, I will include this in my IVF course that I have um, yeah, online for folks so that they're, you know, as they're preparing for their IVF cycle, I think that not everyone gets as adequate informed consent as they could or should when it comes to PGTA. So I feel like no matter what your age is, this would be a really important um, uh, show for people to listen to. Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners today? Yeah, I mean, I think just digging into the details a little bit more of this trial that were somewhat glossed over was that there was, even looking at these results of this trial, which is by some being kind of promoted as a trial showing that PGTA, you know, isn't necessary or doesn't work or doesn't improve outcomes, there was a higher live birth, you know, per transfer. Um, it was about both groups. Did, did really well. Um, forget the exact numbers. I think it was 65%. Yeah, but if you look at the the number of transfers performed to achieve these babies, You're right? It was 65.4%. You got it versus, right. Versus yeah. 59%. So not a huge difference. And again, it shows that in a young population, you don't quote unquote need to do PGTA. They did really well, like 59% live birth per transfer is great but it was significantly higher. So again, I don't think the biopsy is significantly harming the embryo if done safely and well. And the miscarriage risk is relatively low in this young average age 29 population, but, but it's not zero. And not all miscarriages are due to chromosomal aneuploidy, but a lot of them are. So, so it was roughly 12% to 8 point something percent it was over a 40% higher risk of miscarriage, although it still was only 12%. But as you know, each clinical miscarriage is devastating, takes months to recover from. Again, patients get discouraged and maybe don't come back for a while. So preventing that is lost over by, again, critics who say, you know, it doesn't improve live birth rates. You get the same number of 
or you get a non-inferior, you know, number of babies, yes, but getting fewer miscarriages is a big deal. And I would argue probably that would be more pronounced, you know, in an age group with an average age of 39 instead of 29. Um, and some studies have suggested that. Um, so, so again, my take home message, even in a study that within a population that's not you know, not the population that probably benefits most from PGTA, but I think it's still reasonable to offer it to this population, even in that population, even with kind of a bias of limiting how many embryos they could select from, they still ended up with about the same number of live births, but with fewer transfers, so fewer failed transfers and fewer miscarriages. So I mean, I think this is more evidence that PGTA actually does work. Um, and I like hearing, again, stories, and I don't like hearing stories of, 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 you know, bad things that happen, but hearing from patients that say, you know, they didn't do PGTA and they, they had losses and then they did and the first transfer worked. I mean, these are just anecdotal, but I, I mean, I think if done appropriately, there's a role for PGTA. It can work. And not required or mandatory. Everyone doesn't have to do it. And young patients can do well if they're willing to transfer one embryo at a time. And even older patients, because it's not perfect, if they really, you know, again, wouldn't terminate, you know, a, a trisomy 21 pregnancy, not everybody would, you know, or they would be uncomfortable not transferring that embryo, then it's reasonable not to do PGTA. And they're willing to go through, you know, fail transfer miscarriage and ultimately they want to give every embryo a chance i think that's reasonable too but i think okay. again there is a role it can be done effectively and it can really help enhance selection for single embryo transfer right so as a patient you should be able to describe to your doctor what your priorities are so you can figure out what the right ivf plan is for you eric thank you so much for coming on today's egg whisper show for people who want to follow you see you as a patient can you tell us where they can find you Oh, yeah. So um, my hand would be Eric Foreman, MD, E-R-I-C-F-O-R-M-A-N-M-D. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And I really enjoy following you and your posts and your podcast. So keep up the great work. And um, I look forward to speaking to you again. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Eric. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadeh. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 